I'm Lee Morrison and welcome back to Bespoke Edit YouTube channel. In the previous film um, I tried to demonstrate um, stretching of uh, a shoe that was a little bit too small. Um, we have here, um, it's a 1933, it was made in 1933, it's a bespoke shoe made by an English maker called uh, Wildsmith. Um, it's absolutely magical shoe, in beautiful original condition, but it's simply too small for me, or at least it was too small. This one now fits me. The original, which has been untreated, is too small. Um, it looks rather obscure with, um, with these various implements, kitchen implements, their spatulas and chisels and screwdrivers sticking out. Um, in the previous film, I demonstrated the technique in full. Um, the, uh, it was just simply a universal wooden, wooden, wooden tree that uh, that's flexes its universal shape. And most of us sort of have these at home. Um, I wanted to demonstrate a technique um, where you didn't need professional stretching equipment, um, just a few spatulas, some stretching spray, um, a few chisels. And um, basically, in short, what I do is put the tree in place. Having treated the skins, it's important to treat the skins with the stretching spray, which is demonstrated in great detail in the previous film. Now, just use a, um, use a chisel um, or a screwdriver, or I could even use an old knife, anything just that was strong, just to force force open the gap between, you know, in, in, in the stretcher. And then the, the, the implements are then dropped into that gap to stop it returning. Um, it's, it's, dem it's demonstrated in great detail in the previous film, so I do advise you to watch that if you've not already seen it. Now, um, I've actually repeated the process, uh, I think it's three times. Um, there's, there is a limit to what you can achieve in one stretch, and it's about sort of three or four millimeters, it's pretty safe. You can do more, but you do risk sort of rupturing and bursting the skins. Um, this is actually under great tension. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of, there's a lot packed in there, at least sort of, at least 15 millimeters thick. Um, of, of, it's been forced. And um, when I pull these out, a, li a little bit will spring back. And um, the shoe's got a slight curvature. You can just see a slight curve. It's under enormous tension. When I pull these out, that will straighten up slightly. It'll lose a little bit of the length that's being forced here, but at least two thirds of it will remain. Um, let's have a look, um, see what the original size is. Um, if I can try and compare the two, let's have a look. Actually, because I'm wearing dark, you can't see this. Uh, the dark shoe against the dark top. So actually, I've got a newspaper here. Let's just, um, if I pop this behind, you know, you try and make a light background, um, you'll be able to see the difference, hopefully, because it's quite extreme. Right, let's just pop these. Oh, I'm going to struggle here. Here we go. That's it. Looks a bit silly, this, but uh, we'll do it. Okay. Yeah, we just need a light background so you can see the difference. Now, that's the two shoes end on end. And as I can see quite clear there's a six, seven millimeter difference in the length. Um, this shoe uh, with the implement sticking out is considerably longer. I'm very, very pleased with that. Okay, let's just pop that down. Me and my crude methods. Okay. Um, we've, I've also uh, needed a little bit of extra width. As these implements were forced in, it, it rammed the, on great tension the, the tapered wedge in and it's kept a very similar shape but it's just as it's rammed down because it's tapered the wedge is tapered it's it's forced in and it's it's, it's forced a little bit of uh, width only i don't know let's say three millimeters and we are looking at as much as you know between eight and ten millimeters in in length let me pop these out let's have a look okay as a those of you that watched the original video will notice that there are considerably more implements um, inserted. Um, when, we, when we started um, the first stretch, um, we were really struggling to get you know, these, uh, these wooden spatulas in. The, without the forcing of the screwdriver, or it was a chisel, we couldn't, we couldn't slip these into the, into the gap of the, uh, of the stretcher. They just couldn't, you know, they go in very easily now. Whereas this one was original. There's no, we can just, if I force it, I can get one in, but we, there definitely isn't enough room to get two and the extra chisels. Um, so yeah, I can even get my finger in there. So there is a huge, huge amount. 
Um, just to remind you what I've done, um, I, I use the use a screwdriver just to force the extra length and then to stop it returning, you know, packed in some implements. It doesn't matter if it could be pegs, could be anything, you know, cutlery. These are, these are just kitchen spatulas. And I've repeated the process a couple of times. Um, so now they slip in very easily. And um, I've, even, I've even managed to get uh, extra chisels, screwdrivers. So I've just sort of forced those in and used a, used a rubber mallet. Just tap them in. Um, obviously I'm being a lot more careful when I'm, you know, I'm just demonstrating what I've done the last couple of stretches. Um, the first stretch wasn't adequate. As I said to you, um, this, the process has been repeated three times. Um, I was hoping to do it in one go, but it just wasn't enough. I could get the shoe on, but it was still a little bit tight, even though I'd, I'd gained, I was hoping it was up, up to six or seven millimeters, but it wasn't that, it's was only about three millimeters. So I allowed it to dry overnight and repeated the process that was demonstrated in the previous video. Let's get all of this uh, tooling out of the way. Now, um, now that I'm very happy with the size and the shape, it can maintain the original shape beautifully, and it really is a gorgeous shape. It's gorgeous to contouring, beautiful sort of chisel toes. Um, it's really only bespoke shoes, and there are now one or two, only one or two um, manufacturers that do ready-to-wear shoes of, 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 of approaching this sort of standard. Um, they really are stunning and um, I'm very much looking forward to wearing them. Now, um, there are a few minor, very minor um, sort of chips. I'm not sure how they've happened, but they're a very, very old shoe. They've probably been clipped on steps or whatever. And um, there's a little, very, very tiny bit of extremely minor cracking. I could ignore this. I could simply just moisturize them, polish them and wear them. But to be honest, with you, I do want them to be perfect. Um, the eagle-eyed of you might be able to just see there's evidence of a little tiny crack there and here. Um, before I started this stretching process, and this, this was when I bought the shoes, um, all of the stitching around the edge of the heel here, it had failed due to age. It was, it's, it's like a linen stitch and it just rots with time. And so then um, if the shoes are worn, there's nothing actually holding the shoes together um, and enormous uh, tensions put on the skins, then they start to split. So that, um, that, that had happened. Um, off camera, um, I've opened, separated all of the lining from the outer skins and I've inserted um, very fine pieces of chamois leather. Um, it's very similar to the leather you would use for sort of cleaning a car. Um, I've glued that in place closed it as like a sandwich and re-stitched by hand through all the original holes all the way through and there's also the the, the original makers it's like a very fine bit of um it's like a ribbon but it's much stronger than ribbon it's like a i'm not sure what it is but it's, it's some kind of a, a, a ribbon type fabric that goes all the way around it's sort of it's stitched in and that takes the strain on of the leather so i've, I've made sure that that was back in because it'll come loose so um, once these have been sort of sanded slightly, recolored and repolished, the, the evidence of the, uh, of the splits in the skin um, is not really going to be visible. Um, but nonetheless, they are a beautiful shoe. So what I'm going to be doing now, um, I'm actually going to start to resurface very delicately these skins. And um, this is, I've got a couple of different grades of papers here. This is uh, 180 grit. This is 400 grit, it's quite fine. I'm just going to very, very lightly sand the surface of the skins. Seems horrifying, but to be honest with you, I've done it on, on, on dozens of pairs of shoes. I'm popping these gloves on. I don't particularly like the feel of the gritty paper and, and it, it does tend to scratch my skin. So um, I'm just putting these gloves on. This is not dangerous. I just don't like scuffing up my skin. Try and protect my skin a little bit with these uh, funny gloves. So, uh, you might have seen me, if you've watched my previous videos, you might have seen me do this before. Uh, now this will take off just a few microns of the surface of the skin. And where, the, where there are tiny chips and scratches, there is a very mild scratch just here. Extremely mild surface cracking. So I'm just going to just do circular motions. And just light pressure with a sharpish, this is, uh, well, let me just remind myself, it's 180 grit. Um, it's slightly, uh, slightly sharp, um, so very light pressure, and I'm just, uh, just removing the very, very mm, surface skin. It's, it's very much like um, 
uh, well, ladies will be more familiar than, than a lot of men, you know, sort of uh, uh, using abrasives on the skin, like um, not dermabrasion, of course, that's more of a medical, but um, I don't know, like a, like a scrubbing pad, like a nylon pad or, um, you know, crushed, crushed almond seed to, to sort of take off the uh, very fine surface of the skin. Um, it's very similar to what I'm doing here. Obviously, when the skin's smooth, the makeup goes on smoother. And what I'm trying to do is make the skin's very smooth here and um, apply, the, uh, apply the, the, the creams and polishes afterwards for extremely smooth skins. I will, I will be re-dyeing this skin. Uh, I do have some dye here, it's liquid dye. Um, I could probably manage with just the moisturiser, the, the darkened moisturiser and the dark polish, but um, I really do want a really deep intensity of colour. So I'm actually going to, I'm actually going to be dyeing first. Um, it's a quite a repetitive process, this. Um, it's, uh, I won't do the whole thing on camera. It's going to take about half an hour to do the whole shoe. And if you've watched my previous films, you will have seen me do this before. Um, but it was much more dramatic than the previous one. There were deep, sort of deep cr cracks and splits in the skin. So I started with a much sharper paper. But this is extremely mild, extremely light. And um, yeah, it's, no, it's no worse than sort of, you know, if you, if, you, if you get sort of rough skin on your feet, you know, you use sort of some kind of abrasive file or, you know, uh, ground almond seeds, etc., just to take the rough skin off. And that's really what I'm doing. Very, very similar to using a, you know, a, and it's called an exfoliant is the word I'm looking for, um, to exfoliate the skin. And um, yeah, it's very, very similar. So uh, it's, it's, it looks really dramatic. It looks quite risky on a, on a beautiful bespoke shoe like this I'm using, which is a little more than sandpaper. It's an engineer's paper. Um, sandpapers tend to disintegrate. So um, it's a very repetitive process. Um, paper's a bit clogged, so um, let's go for a bit more. There's obviously residue of polish, um, which I've tried to remove uh, with, uh, with the methylated spirit. Um, unsuccessfully removing it all. So uh, the, the last of the little bits of polish will be coming off. And any sort of low spots, um, let's see, there's a dark bit there, dark bit there. They are, and the lighter bits around it are, are high spots. Um, it, it's not entirely smooth. And if you're not polishing an entirely smooth surface, you don't get a perfect shine. So if I sort of keep sanding and keep sanding, it's only, a, you can just feel it, but it is actually quite visible. So if I keep sanding, you know, that dark spot in the middle there, that will disappear. Yeah, that's actually a low spot. So I just need to take the high areas off around it and uh, with the sharper, with the sharper paper and um, down into the welt area. And I do know there was a few scratches down here. So. Yeah, it, it, takes, it does take time, and uh, so you go over the whole shoe. Um, I'm not going to do the whole thing on camera, it's rather tedious to watch. Um, so it will take about 30 minutes, circular motions. And then when I'm reasonably happy that uh, we're getting close, I'm going to change the paper. I do have a finer paper which has just dropped. Ooh, excuse me. Let's just uh, take a piece of a finer paper, that's the 400 grit. So uh, once again, I'll go over the whole shoe with the, uh, with the much finer paper. There's a, there are some low spots here which are showing up dark, so I do need to return to the sharper paper just to try and give it a slightly deeper cut. If you're not feeling brave, um, it's not on a shoe of this quality, it's not 100% necessary, but I want to achieve a perfect finish. So um, this, this is necessary, but if I wasn't being so fussy, um, we could just moisturize and polish this shoe as it is. But being as I'm looking to keep them permanently in my collection, we've got them at this stage where they're stripped down. I'm not going to miss the opportunity to, to resurface them very carefully. Um, so it is just a repetitive case between the different grits, you know, between the slightly coarser and the much finer finishing paper. Is that the wrong is that the right? Yeah, wrong side. But um, I'm not going to uh, bore you to tears with uh, continuing to do the whole shoe on camera. What I'm going to do, I'm going to switch off the camera here and we'll come back when the shoe's entirely finished. Um, so the whole thing will be grey, won't have any sort of dark areas which are the low spots. But that's going to take me about 30 minutes off camera. Then um, we'll come back and then I'm going to re-dye, just with a liquid dye. Um, I'll re-dye the whole shoe. 
Um, it's, not, it's not difficult. Um, we're not changing the colour, we're just refreshing and uh, bringing back a deep intensity of colour. It could be achieved to, a, to, a, to a, probably a less successful degree, but we could get a respectable result purely with moisturisers and polish but beans we've come this far I do, I do want it to be 100 percent so i'm going to dye it let me stop here um, i'll finish the shoe off camera when we come back the whole shoe will appear very gray and we'll just go through the uh, a quick a quick sort of uh, dyeing process okay so the um the shoe's been completely uh sanded um it's not been um, it's not it's not an aggressive sand this one there was not much wrong with the shoe in the first place um the previous series um there was a tan shoe and that was in dreadful state. It had deep gouges and cracks and splits and we resurfaced quite aggressively um, to, to give a presentable finish. And these could have, could have been left alone, but I really did want to be 100% fussy. So I've given very, very light sand all over. They do look, look a bit sorry in this state, you know, but um, it is a beautiful surface to be preparing and you know, prepar prepared for, for the dyeing process. Um, I'm going to get, get a newspaper, I don't particularly want to uh, get the dye all over my wooden surface. Um, the dye is rather messy. Um, it's, a, it's a liquid dye, um, you, you apply it with a, actually this is a very very crude tool, it's just like a little bit of, uh, I don't know, it's like a little bit of wool, so I'm not sure what it is actually, it's, it's very very furry. Um, it's fine for the purpose here, uh, I just want to give it a quick, a quick lick of dye all over, in, including the edging. Um, so this sort of crude tool is adequate for the job. Um, I will be doing um, complete colour changes and I might even um, sort of change, change the colour of some correspondence or spectators whereby they have different, different colours throughout the shoe. So you've got to be very, very accurate. This, this would be absolutely useless for that purpose. It's way too crude. So I'd use much more finer artist brushes. Sometimes I don't want to get the dye on the edges. So you have to hold the shoe upside down, use an artist brush. And, and dab it in very carefully but this is just going to be very quick you know just dip it in the dye and and just just rub it in doesn't matter if it goes all over I want it on the sole just to kind of refresh the original colour I'm not trying to do a colour change as I said so I'll definitely come back and do a do another film where, where we're doing a colour change so it is messy so I need these gloves on it does stain uh, you do not want it on your clothes you don't want it on your skin or uh, newspaper is quite absorbent um, it's um, by just by its nature it's kind of a cheaper cheaper quality it's very very porous paper yeah expensive papers have a bit of a shine on them and they tend to you know, the, the, the the if you get any drips it tends to run rather than absorb straight into the uh, so your know, newspaper is perfect for this so let's just get the uh, get the gloves on to protect my skin oof sticky old things <laughs> We're nearly on. There we go. That'll do. Yeah, I'm just trying to protect my skin. It's not. Um, oops, it's split there. But it's it's the pads of the fingers I'm worried about. Okay, so there is a, a safety. It's like a it's like a, a lid on the you know, an internal lid. I'm just going to slit around that with a knife. Um, it's just like a seal. There we go. But uh, yeah, it's very very important not to create any spills. Um, anything it touches, your fabric of your furniture, your clothes, the shiny wooden surface, it will indeed dye it and dye it permanently. You can't really get it out. So let's just uh, deliberately let that soak into the, uh, the small knife on the newspaper. So just use this funny little applicator and uh, bring the shoe a little bit closer. I'm just going to literally daub it on. It's a very, very easy process. There's nothing more to it than that. It's very, very important to use a solvent-based uh, dye, either a solvent base or a water base. This one's solvent base. You do get um, some of the dyes, uh, um, they, 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 what, what happens with the water or the solvent-based dyes, they suck into the skin, they don't sit on the surface. Um, if you can get the, um, the dyes that are more like, um, goes on like a vinyl coating. Um, it's more like nail varnish on your leather. It's an absolute nightmare. It will totally ruin your shoes. So do be careful of you know, making sure you select the, uh, the correct dye. Um, there we go, just carefully rubbing it into the welts and rub it around the, uh, around the edge of the sole. I want that. I've, I've, sanded, the, I've sanded all the old polishes off. Um, you know, just uh, with a slightly sharper, slightly sharper paper. 
I think that was eight to grit, then the 120, then the 400 grit, just to give a nice fine finish. Um, but uh, as I was saying, if you're selecting dye and you're not really sure, do test it on, um, this is a dye I'm familiar with, so you know I'm happy to just go straight in, but it's very, very important to test it on something less precious. If it does turn out to be one of these, um, one of these dyes that's more like a vinyl, um, it just yeah it, it just sits on the surface this is this is soaking in beautifully and um, just soaks straight into the skin leaves quite a matte finish which we can then um, you know polish up very well afterwards I'm going to start with the dyeing process here um, it, it is rather messy and I shouldn't be doing it indoors in, a, in this environment I'm going to put this messy dauber down um, it's a very repetitive process, obviously, as you've already seen. I've, I've, I've done all of this side. The last little bit um, around here, the last third needs doing, but it's, it's exactly the same process. Um, but as I said, I just don't want to risk making any, any, any mess, and uh, I, I want to go and finish the job off, and the other shoe off camera, somewhere more appropriate, ideally outdoors. This, I can't stress enough, it's a very risky sort of process to be doing indoors with furniture and so on. Anything this dye touches, it ruins skin, furniture, anything at all. So, as I say, I'm going to stop. Um, but um, it's an easy enough process. Um, it's, 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 it's very, very simple. Just a simple dauber. You've seen me apply it. Now, um, this will dry to, to quite a matte finish. Um, it doesn't look very impressive once it's dyed. Dye doesn't shine. It, it sinks deeply into the surface. Um, it's a solvent base. It sinks in. Um, and the, the, basically what I'll do, I'll, I'll quickly finish the other side. It'll take me about another five minutes, but I'm not going to do it in this room. And then I'll leave about 24 hours for it to dry. Um, and what, what um, our, our, the next process will be actually moisturising. Um, it's extremely important. Um, you, I, I, the shoe, if this were quickly polished, it would look gorgeous, but it would still be very dry. And at that point, when you start sort of bending the shoe and wearing it, it reflects very, very high risk of causing cracking across the vamps here. And, and this area, as we know, um, I discussed that earlier in the film, had already started to, because the stitching had failed it had started to split. So those skins are very dry, even though they do look lovely. Um, the moisturising process is quite simple. Um, I just use um, shoe creams. It's, it's, it's a moisturiser and you can either have them as a neutral or you can have them coloured. With this one, for the outsides, I'm going to use a deep, intense black. Now, I will be, I will be dyeing the insides. It's, it's the, the, the lining. It's, it's tan. Now, this gets forgotten by a lot of people. It's only a skin and it gets sort of a lot of abrasion from the feet. Moreover, feet perspire and um, that soaks into the lining. Now that perspiration causes a, a constant dampening of the skins and it does become very, very dry. And um, so it's extremely important to thoroughly clean the inside, perhaps with the meths or um, a, similar, a similar mild solvent. And then moisturise all of the inside of the skins right down into the toe. Just dip the, dip the, dip the uh, cream on a cloth and really sort of poke it in. If you can't get your fingers in, what I tend to do is sort of wrap a cloth around a, a spoon or a wooden spatula, dip that in and fish away. You have to sort of get the moisturiser on all over the skins all on the back of the tongue, also on the soles. These, these soles are in gorgeous condition. They are from 1933. They've still got the original nails on the heel. So they've clearly not had um, a lot of punishment, these shoes, but they are very, very old. That is a skin. It's, it is leather and it does dry. So I'll be moisturising the soles quite intensively with the black cream. Um, I'll probably apply the cream every day um, for about a week, maybe even 10 days. You know, you just very, very simple. You know, I'll, I'll moisturize the insides and then pop the trees back in. I'll moisturize all of the outsides. It's very, very simple. Just keep, you know, just dab it into the pot and, and work into the skins, not forgetting to do the soles. Let it dry. I'll give it a quick brush with a, with, a, with a dry brush. Then this is quite important. You take the tree out and very, very carefully just sort of work the skins. Don't rough it about. Don't rag it about. Just, just work the skin. Just poke at it. Make it, force it to be quite flexible. Just, just they are very stiff. They've had a, a chemical strip. Uh, the, the dye itself has a solvent in there, which does tend to have a drying effect as well as a dyeing effect. Just, just slowly work the skins supple again, pop the trees back in, then go through the whole process again. 
These are very old. Um, a newer shoe, um, one or two applications of the, um, of the moisturizer would be perfectly adequate. Um, but these are very, very old and I do want to thoroughly uh, moisturize them. I need their skins to be absolutely saturated. They're in a very dry state. They've been stripped and they are very old. They've been stripped with chemicals. The dyeing process it has a slight drying effect. So I need the skins to really absorb. Um, it will, and they will come up absolutely beautifully. Only when I'm happy that the skins are thoroughly moisturized and that they're extremely soft and flexible and there's no, when they're hard, when you move them, move them with your fingers, when they're dry, you move it with your fingers, you can hear a slight crackling. It's not a good sign. Um, so more moisturizers is required. When they're thoroughly moisturized, they'll be, the skins will be, they'll move silently. Only at that point will I um, come on to the uh, process of polishing. And I do want to give these almost like a military type of polish, an extremely glossy, like a glassage finish to the toes and around the heel area. You can't achieve that type of shine all over the shoe, particularly around the vamps and anywhere where the shoe sort of bends when you walk, you can't achieve that level of shine. It's the polish builds up thickly and it, as soon as it bends, it simply cracks. So uh, you only realistically have one or two coats of polish here, but 10 or 15 or 20 on the toes and around here, however much it takes, you can just keep applying it. We'll come back to that, that'll be the next video. Um, as I was saying um, earlier in this film a few minutes ago, um, a lot of people do ask, why don't you just buy the shoes the right size? Um, but I, they're not thoroughly, uh, completely thoroughly, thoroughly understanding what it is that I'm doing here. These are antique shoes, they are bespoke made, they were made specifically for one person's feet. Um, in very, very much the same way you'd have a, a suit made. These would only realistically fit the, ma the, the wearer, the, the original wearer. Um, they're so tightly sculpted and so tightly chiseled that it's almost like vacuum packed onto the original wearer's feet. Now, when you buy secondhand bespoke shoes, even if they are roughly your size, like I wear a 9.5, and if I bought a nine, roughly nine, nine and a half, the chance of them fitting is very, very slim. Um, they were sculpted individually for somebody else's feet. And this is really what I'm doing. I'm trying to buy these beautiful shoes. Then instead of having them sitting around my house as, as ornaments, I'm trying to modify them very, very discreetly to fit myself. That might need, um, maybe there's no length required at all. Maybe it's just a little bit of width. Maybe the width is fine, but they're too flat. So um, there's so many areas that um, have to be addressed. And of course, there's the, 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 te the texture and the condition of the skins that constantly need attention. And on a very, very old shoe, that's always a big concern. Um, even if something looks perfect, um, when, you, when, you know, when you buy it, you think, wow. Uh, as did these, these look absolutely gorgeous. I could have just polished them and worn them, but they almost definitely would have split and cracked. The skins are so old, they really do need stripping right back like what I've demonstrated in this series of films. Moisturize them thoroughly, which will be the next step before you polish them and wear them. If I go through those, um, all of those steps, all of those processes, these shoes are gonna be, uh, they're gonna be perfect for an awful long time. <clears throat> now, let's just get the other shoe. Um, I do get some people ask questions, some people are rather aggressive actually with their questioning um, on my Instagram account, Bespoke Addict, and they're sort of accusing me of destroying the heritage, of destroying the natural patina. Now, these shoes to me, these are my everyday attire. They're not ornaments. I don't want a house full of ornaments, which I can't wear. I actually want the items to be, to be usable as an everyday. Now, I try very, very hard to maintain the original sort of, uh, all of the original sculpture that the, the original maker put there. Now, this shoe has been modified and this shoe, this shoe is totally original. It's yet to be done. Now, um, looking at the shoes, you can clear, yeah, this one is slightly larger. Um, but the original shape, I've worked very, very hard to keep the original sort of contours, the original sort of chiseling of the toe. And um, that's very key. I, I, I love what the original maker did. And I'm not in any way wishing to modify or change that sort of styling. I, I, I do work ever so hard to try and maintain what, what was originally there. That's what's attractive to me in the first place. But without the modifications, I simply can't wear them and I don't want ornaments. Um, 
It, the other thing is um, buying uh, buying secondhand bespoke. There's a there's a big cost difference. Um, I've got uh, an awful lot of shoes, and realistically, if uh, you know, if I were having every single pair made bespoke to order, number one, I don't think I'd live long enough. These things are a very very long process from initially sort of contacting the maker and going through your requirements and your design to having your your fittings and your measurements. It's around about a year per pair. Now I've got, I've got an awful lot of shoes and even if I use four or five makers at a time, commissioning uh, one at a time, I, I honestly don't think I'd live long enough to be able to amass a collection of bespoke made for myself. Moreover, is the cost. I, I do not have the sort of money spare to be spending on tens and tens and tens of pairs of bespoke. Um, I, I, I tried to do a quick sort of calculation if I were to have commissioned every pair in my collection. And, and paid the full price that a bespoke shoe costs, it would be way in excess of half a million pounds in today's terms. So this shoe, um, <clears throat> they were made in 1933 by Wildsmith. Sadly, Wildsmith is um, no longer operating as a bespoke maker, but they really were sensational. Um, there's only a handful of makers in the world that are currently available that can make a shoe to this standard. Um, there's, I think, four definitely in the UK. Um, the, the, you know, the, the, the really old makers like John Lobb, Foster and & Son and George Cleverley. And then there's a fantastic newer company, uh, Gaziolo & Girling. You know, they could definitely produce a shoe of this quality, um, bespoke. Um, the ready-to-wear um, shoes, they don't fit like bespoke because a ready-to-wear shoe, the idea is that somebody can come into the store and try it on and it would fit most people. A size 9 or a size 10 would fit most people with a size 9 or 10 foot. Um, bespoke somewhat different. They, 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 they are very peculiar to the, to the makers, the maker, I beg your pardon, to the, to the wearer's feet. And somebody else doesn't have those same peculiarities. Um, but um, it's, it's, it's a shame because when, you, uh, when you're wearing ready to wear, they do not have the same level of deep, intense. Um, so this shoe, it kind of, it almost sort of, it almost stands proud. It, it's, it's got this fantastic um, sort of a life about it, which a ready to wear shoe tends to be a lot flatter. Um, and it's, there's an enormous difference in cost. A, a, a very good ready to wear shoe today. Um, the high-end ones are sort of four or five hundred pounds, but you can get respectable ready-to-wear shoes for around about two hundred. A bespoke shoe of this quality made by one of the makers that I mentioned a few seconds ago would be realistically in the region of between four, maybe five thousand pounds. Now, um, I certainly don't have the spare money to be able to have lots and lots. I, you know, if I were buying bespoke only, I'd only have literally a handful of shoes in my collection. They'd be very fine, but that would be it. Um, but it's not about the, the, the money and the, the ex extreme value for me. I just love the styling. And um, I'm looking forward to wearing these. So let me, um, let me end this video here. And um, we will come back to this shoe when, um, when, when I've re-dyed it and it's completely dried and I'll, 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 I will moisturise the whole shoe. And you'll see this shoe when it's had about a, about a week's worth of intense moisturising and I'll apply the top finish of, um, of, of, of uh, polish. Because this shoe has been sanded, it won't be a difficult job polishing you know the polish will build very quickly um, it's been sanded it's been very delicately resurfaced and I've got nothing really to hide with the um, with the polish all I want to do is give a lovely sheen so I'm going to finish here and um, I'm going to say thank you for watching I do hope you've enjoyed this um, this film my name's Lee Morrison this is Bespoke Addict YouTube channel